Okay, so this quick video here is going to cover the basic anatomy of the respiratory system. Um, we're going to ideally start here um, and kind of follow the pathway that air would take going all the way down to the air sacs at the very end. Uh, so that's kind of our plan, um, and let's jump right into it. Okay, so the first thing that's on your uh, unit outline there is the nose. Okay, so the structure of the nose, generally this little chunk right here, um, and primarily made of bone and cartilage. So the very top part here is bone, remember nasal bone from earlier in the year, um, and then this is all cartilage and skin that goes from there. Um, it is the main access way. Uh, we can breathe through our mouth or through our nose. Um, nose is a little bit better at filtering and cleaning in the air. Um, so that's where we're designed really to breathe from. And uh, at the very initial opening, you've got lots of little nose hairs there that are part of the filtering process. Right? So in terms of functions, um, helps filter the air, begins filtering the air, and it's uh, the entryway. Um, and structure, it's made out of bone at the very top, nasal bone, and cartilage. All right. So directly behind that then is the nasal cavity. So that's our second section. Um, and it's this whole chunk from right about here to here. Um, and uh, the basic structure is it's just the hollow space. Okay. Um, and when people say it's hollow, it really doesn't have all that much area. Um, when you get in there, you've got these nasal concha. That's a vocab word you want to make sure you know. Um, might go into the structure there. And there are these big hooks that kind of stick out. It looks like they're just kind of wrinkles on here, but they're actually these three big hooks that I'll show you um, in the next view, uh, give you a little bit better idea. Um, and uh, what that means is the air actually has to slide pretty close by here. Uh, there's not a lot of open space, so as the air squ squeezes by, we're going to do our first um, true filtering of the air. Uh, we're also going to adjust the temperature and adjust the moisture. So by the time the air gets all the way down to the lungs, so it passes all the way through here, goes through all these airways all the way down, uh, it should be 100% humidity, and the temperature should match our body. So if you're outside and, you know, 10 degree, air, we really should not have 10 degree air hitting the air sacs, it should be nice and warmed um, and match the, the temperature. So uh, we have mucus all through here, um, and mucus traps a whole bunch of stuff and does all, and uh, filters the air. Right? Uh, there's a little section on your sheet that talks about the cilia, so uh, remember that this is pseudo-stratified, P-S-E-U-D-O, okay, pseudo-stratified, which means it has lots of cilia. Okay. And the cilia are the little hairs that are actually going to shovel. When we trap mucus in here, it's actually going to shovel in two different directions. So from the top, the cilia is going to shovel all the mucus from this direction back down to here. Okay. Um, and from here, or from our trachea, it's actually going to shovel all the mucus this way. And both of those spots will just get swallowed all day long. Um, and in that mucus, you'll have all sorts of dirt and dust and stuff like that, and that just goes down the esophagus, down to your stomach, and your stomach has acid to destroy anything that's in there. Uh, but it's a pretty efficient disposal. Um, if you are sick, sometimes that mucus is too thick for the cilia to move, and that's when you got to blow your nose and you're congested all the time. It just it can become too thick, and the the, the airways actually become narrow by um, by inflammation as well. So here is a series of pictures actually showing cilia. So this is actually cilia here, all those little hairs. Um, and again, we have them in the nose, and they would shovel kind of backwards. And we have them in the trachea and all these airways, and they would kind of shovel upward. Um, and this is zoomed in. So these cells, the mucus cells, also called goblet cells, they make mucus. This whole surface is covered with mucus. As the air flows over, all sorts of dirt and dust and you know pollen, whatever it is, bacteria, viruses should get trapped in there. And then the mucus can be shoveled upward or downward depending on where you're at so it can be disposed of. Right. Uh, in this view, um, this is actually a cross section so you can kind of see by this picture over on the side how it's sliced. So it's right down through the guy's face. Um, and what you're actually seeing, um, so you've got eyes to give you a ballpark of where we're at, okay, and you've got the sinuses, the hollow spots that we're going to talk about um, in a little bit here. I think it's our next step. Um, but what I want to point out right now is the nasal conscious. So see these big hooks? So this is actually your nasal cavity. It's not a big, narrow, uh, big open space. It's got a wall down the middle called the septum. Okay? Um, some people have a bend to that, so it sticks to one side. They call that a deviated septum, and it interferes with breathing in a lot of people. 
Um, but here, the nasal conscious, you can imagine, as air is squeezing by here, guys, there's not a lot of empty space. Um, so a molecule of air coming from, like, going from this direction and going, passing through there, there's not a lot of empty space. So it's going to come in contact with mucus, it's going to get filtered, it's going to get moisturized, it's going to get heated or the temperature adjusted um, out to the right air. And then also, if this is, if you get sick and this becomes inflamed, you can imagine how these kind of swell shut. Um, there isn't much space. If this swells up some, uh, you're going to get lots of problems. Okay. Um, the other interesting part about this is these are loaded blood vessels. Lots of blood vessels below the surface, and this is where most nosebleeds come from when you when you actually damage the nasal concha, um, and then the blood starts to drain out. Um, and the purpose of the blood is to provide that heat. Remember, we're going to we're going to adjust the temperature of the air. Um, and then all of the moisture for the mucus comes from those blood vessels. So all of this is loaded, loaded, loaded with capillaries um, on, for those purposes. All right, so the next thing we want to talk about, guys, we want to quickly talk about um, the sinuses. Okay, so the first one uh, that we have up here is the frontal sinus, right in the middle of the frontal bone. Um, right here you have your uh, uh, maxillary sinus right on the side here, so this big hollow spot. Um, and they are hollow spots, but they also, they do produce mucus. They produce some of the mucus. So you can actually see in this picture, there's a little drainage hole right there at the top. Um, so that spot actually drains mucus into the nasal cavity, all right? Um, when you are sick, um, those sometimes get uh, plugged up and, and they don't, um, and they can become infected themselves and cause lots of pain and this swells with pressure because you get all that mucus building up inside there. Um, Function-wise, well, they help produce the mucus, which is important for the filtering and the warming and all that stuff we've talked about already. But they also work as kind of a resonance chamber for our voice. So a lot of your richness, um, think of like an acoustic instrument. So you think of like an a, a, um, acoustic guitar. Um, the whole back chamber of that acoustic guitar is called a resonance chamber, and the vibrations go um, into that chamber, and it kind of adds a richness to it. If you crack the back of that guitar, it sounds very flat and dull. Same thing happens with your um, nasal sinuses. If you don't have, um, if they're not there and they're not empty and you don't get the good resonance out of them, you end up with a very flat voice. And you, you hear that when people are sick. Um, and that's partially vocal cords, but it's also, uh, if this gets filled with mucus, um, if these two sides are filled with mucus here, you don't get a lot of resonance out of there. Um, and, and the voice sounds very flat. So the next thing on your packet is the pharynx, okay? And the pharynx we covered last unit, but it's this whole area kind of behind the mouth, um, depending on where who you ask, but it's usually actually, most of the times it's all of this chunk going to right about here. Um, and they it can be broken down into like the nasopharynx and the oropharynx, but in general it's just the pharynx. And um, it's what we would think of like a throat, okay? Um, and it is a passageway for both air going this way or this way, or food going this way. Uh, so it's a combined passageway for both air and food. It doesn't really do a whole lot um, of filtering because it's pretty wide open. It doesn't do a whole lot of um, digestion. It's just a passageway, which we talked about last year. So the next thing on your uh, sheet is the larynx, okay? And the larynx makes up kind of like right where we would think of as like the Adam's apple of the voice box there. Um, it enlarges in, in guys um, as they... Uh, they age, so it's a little more pronounced than guys, but it's there in everybody. Uh, boys and girls both have that. Um, so, um, wh where is it? It's it's above the trachea, so you can kind of see here's the trachea, and the, the pharynx would have been up here, okay? Um, so we have the pharynx sitting on top, and uh, the trachea down below. And the main job is inside of here, you have the vocal cords. So let's show you the vocal cords. Um, here is a diagram of what they kind of look like. Um, and there's actually two sets of vocal cords. They're called the false and the true. Um, but the basic anatomy is this, guys. So when you look at vocal cords, the opening is called the glottis. That's where air actually passes in or out of the lungs, okay? Um, the epiglottis is that flap that can close it up when we swallow. So you can imagine this thing kind of flapping over that way and closing off that whole piece, all right? Um, and then these guys, the white portions here and here, those are the actual vocal cords. So when air passes over those, they vibrate and they um, uh, they cause movement um, and cause sound as they vibrate, um, just like any string instrument does. So um, that's kind of what we're looking at in that portion. So the part that I kind of skipped over a little bit there for you guys is the idea of the vocal cords. The true vocal cords are the ones that actually vibrate and make sounds. The false ones don't make any sound. They, they're, they're, there are cords there that don't actually make sound. 
Um, and the key here is all about, if you think of this as like a guitar, and it's kind of an ugly guitar, but um, picture that as a guitar, just like any guitar. The um, If you want to make a louder sound, um, make the string vibrate. So that's by screaming or yelling. More air going across that um, makes it vibrate more, and you get a louder sound. So that's how we get louder. Okay. Um, pitch. Um, so that's our intensity, right? So pitch is controlled by how much tension there are. So if I imagine a guitar, if I tighten the string in the guitar, if I yank this string in that direction or in that direction, tightens it more, I get a higher pitch sound. If I loosen the string, if I let it kind of relax, if I let this one over here relax and this one relax, I'll actually get a lower pitch sound. It's all about the tension on the under. Okay? Uh, in general, men have um, a little bit deeper voices because what happens is you end up with um, you, you end up with thicker vocal cords. So if you think about a guitar, also the thicker this string is, the, l the slower the vibration is going to be. Um, and then the, the longer the string, the lower the pitch. So what happens is the, um, the guy's um, larynx enlarges at puberty and, and the string actually becomes longer. So if this was um, the average length of the vocal cord in women, um, men it would be a little bit longer. Um, and because it's a little bit longer and a little bit thicker, it'll actually add up to a deeper sound, okay? Um, and that obviously varies from person to person because you can have men with very high-pitched voices and women with very deep voices, um, but that's generally the makeup from that. So here's an actual picture of the vocal cords. Uh, so the first page before was a, a diagram. This is a, a, an actual picture of it. Um, uh, this is with a laryngoscope, so there's a little camera going down the throat looking. Um, I do have a cool video that you got to remind me to show you in class uh, tomorrow so that we can um, talk a little bit more about this. All right, so the next thing on your list is the trachea. Okay, so the trachea is this tube directly below the larynx. It comes all the way down from here to here. Um, so it's directly below the larynx. It goes down until it splits into each lung. It's what actually will split and then lead into each lung. Um, the structure, okay, the structure um, is really interesting. So we actually looked at this earlier in the year, so hopefully this picture looks somewhat familiar. So the most important thing is that you've got this C-shaped cartilage ring. So see over this in kind of gold over here? So that's a C-shaped cartilage ring. It would actually go a little bit further around. It's not a perfect slice of it. Um, and remember what that does is that allows your um, tray can be a little bit collapsible, collapsible. So the esophagus behind here, when you swallow food, this has to expand, so it pushes into your trachea a little bit and reduces your airway, um, and then it bounces right back out of the way when you're not swallowing. Um, the other thing it has in the walls is lots of smooth muscles. So all around the walls, there's lots of smooth muscle. Um, back here is made of smooth muscle so that we can control the diameter. So you've got the, um, the C-shaped hyaline cartilage rings. That's what that's high, that gold is, the hyaline cartilage rings. Um, and then there's lots of smooth muscle that can control the diameter. And we talked about early in the year. Um, that's what's really going on wrong when someone has asthma is that smooth muscle is constricting um, for no real good reason. Okay? Um, main function in here is, again, our filtering process. So we're going to filter. Not even close. We'll take that. Filter. Um, the air as it comes down. So there's cilia still in there, lots of mucus in there. It's going to filter. We're going to adjust the temperature and then the moisture. Okay, I um, want to make sure that those things are adjusted so the air is perfect by the time it gets way all the way down here to the little air sacs that we're going to. All right. So the next step then is the bronchial tree. So here's the trachea. The air comes down and it splits. Half the air goes to one lung, half the air goes to the other lung, and it enters uh, the bronchial tree. Okay, so the first step where they first brank is called the primary bronchus or primary bronchi. Um, is plural, and then when it splits again here and here, those are called secondary, and then they split again, and that's called tertiary. Um, when it gets even smaller, they're called bronchioles, so the eole at the end here, kind of like um, ito and ita in Spanish, means small, so small bronchi, okay, and then those split into the alveolar ducts, and at the very end, you have the alveoli, and that's the air sac. So every time you've heard somebody talk about air sacs in your lungs, that's what they're actually talking about is the little alveoli um, structures down at the end. Your sheet asks you what's the function then. So if I have to tell you this, you haven't been paying, uh, paying much attention. So the job of all of the airways is to filter the air, 
adjust the temperature of the air and adjust the water content or the moisture of the air, okay, the humidity of the air. Um, so all along the way, you got the cilia still. They can kind of collect stuff in the mucus and shovel it all enough to get rid of. Um, you can adjust the temperature and the moisture all along the way. Right? The last bit of the whole process involves these alveoli. So the alveoli, um, sorry, I don't have a close-up view of that right now. We're going to talk a lot about it in class. But this is where gas is actually exchanged. All around those alveoli would be packed, packed, packed with blood vessels. Um, and so if we zoomed in, so if this is like one of those little air sacs, uh, one of those little tiny bubbles that big, if you looked on the wall of it, the air would come in here, and you would have blood vessels wrapped all the way around. So let's say this is a little capillary going right by it, and you're ideally going to get oxygen diffusing into the blood, and then carbon dioxide diffusing into the air, which then you exhale out. Okay, uh, so this alveolar structure, it is super thin. This is that simple squamous epithelium we talked about earlier, the thinnest stuff we have in the body. Uh, really fast diffusion. We're going to talk about the, that in detail as we go along. Um, in fact, if, and the surface area is tremendous. Um, if you actually were to lay out all of these air sacs, each one of these little bubbles down here, you laid them all out, um, it's estimated there's about 300 million of those alveoli. Okay. And if you took their total combined surface area, it equals about a half a tennis court. Okay. So huge amount of surface area. If you think about one breath coming in and getting spread out over half a tennis court, um, it's pretty amazing. Right, and the last thing on your packet is lungs. Okay, so let's look at the lungs. So this is a cross section, this is like cutting right through somebody's chest, so this would be the front of their body. Um, uh, from that side, here's their back, here's their actual shoulder blades, right? You can kind of see the shoulder blades sticking out a little bit. Um, here's the, the vertebrae, the spinal column right here. Here's the heart smack dab in the middle, okay? And here are the two lungs on either side. So this is the lung and this is the lung. Um, and the first thing you might notice, so here's the lung and here's the lung. First thing you might notice is they're not hollow. They are not big bags, okay? Uh, everybody pictures them as like two big balloons. Well, it's actually about 300 million little tiny balloons. So you're not actually going to see the balloons. What you actually see is all the connective tissue and blood vessels and everything that's around them. So they look a lot more like a sponge. Like when you look at a sponge from far away, it doesn't even look hollow. It doesn't look like there's that much empty space. Um, but then you get up and you look close. There's lots and lots and lots of little empty space here, lots of little tubes going through there. Um, and that's actually where you're going to find... Um, the space. Um, so what's its job? Well, the lung is a spot that houses all of our airways um, going down to so the primary bronchi split, the secondary bronchi split, the tertiary bronchi, down to those bronchioles, down to the alveolar ducts, all the way down to the air, the air sacs. So really and truly, everything in here is just a big complex structure to hold all the blood vessels, all the connective tissue, all the air sacs, all in the exact proximity that they need to be. Um, and that's really what it is. So it's really a big, like, sp like spongy tissue um, that really kind of holds all of this together. Right? Um, the last question you guys have is the function of the serous fluid. So the very outside between, let me get rid of all these lines in here. I love doodling and I make a mess of everything for you. Um, so every, everything on the outside of the lung, so right here between the lung and the chest wall, um, we have a, a fluid called the serous fluid. And serous fluid um, uh, helps, um, what it really does is it makes the outside of the lung sticky. So these lungs are, have a lot of elastic tissue. If you, um, if the lung becomes detached from this wall, you'll actually get a collapsed lung, which most of you guys have heard of before. Um, the big fancy word for that is a pneumo. Thorax, okay? Uh, so pneumothorax, I love putting that on the test, so that's a fancy word for a collapsed lung. Um, so the serous fluid helps keep the lung stuck to the chest wall, so it stays on that chest wall. And when your ribs expand, it, the, the lungs are kind of stuck to the ribs, um, and it kind of pulls open the lungs a little bit. It, it helps along those lines. But it really prevents this really spongy tissue, elastic tissue, from collapsing, because it does. Your lungs have to expand and then bounce back into the normal shape, and then expand and bounce back. So they have this natural elastic tissue that kind of pulls them in this direction, um, and you need that serous fluid that kind of sticks them to that wall so they don't do that, so it kind of keeps them from falling inward. All right? 
So that's our basic stuff, guys. Um, if you miss anything, go back. Uh, make sure that sheet's fairly complete. When we walk in tomorrow, if there's anything you didn't understand, just put a big circle around it. Uh, we'll start off with like a five-minute, um, hey, questions, you got anything along those lines? I got a couple cool little uh, videos to add in. Um, and that's the big idea. So hopefully this made sense, and hopefully it was not too painful for you.